apologies for this. Uh, those of you who know Mark and your watch, you probably see that I am not Mark and watch, but uh, I also was working on this report. Uh, so I'll be happy to share with you some of the findings. Uh, CORE is a confederation of open access repositories. And why do we have this confederation? Because research is becoming increasingly global, collaborative, networked, and distributed. And uh, if we want to build a global knowledge in infrastructure, we really need to work together. And uh, we can't just be building our own separated open access repositories, we need to have a way to link them together. And uh, we also want to make sure that those repositories are not there because we like repositories so much, but uh, because we want to make sure that uh, researchers are really using them uh, in their research workflows. Uh, so CORE is uh, non-for-profit association that was founded uh, by a number of organizations. My organization, IFL, was one of the founding members uh, and it grew up uh, from uh, European Commission funded project Driver, which was about building repository infrastructure in Europe. And Marta, who was supposed to, be, to speak here, she's a treasurer of CORE, but unfortunately she had a date conflict. Uh, uh, we have different members and partners, for example, ICM uh, is also one of core members. And uh, we have different activities, so it's a grassroots organization of repository initiatives and repository managers. And we have different working groups uh, on uh, increasing amount of repository content. And here we also have a task force on uh, open access agreements uh, and licenses, because uh, it's really important to link what we do in our licensing work in libraries with what we do in our open access work. Then we have a working group on repository interoperability and interest group on usage data, control vocabulary, and stuff like that. And a working group on uh, repository and repository network support and training, and uh, uh, here we have uh, a task force uh, on uh, librarians' competencies in support of uh, e-research and scholarly communication. And it's a joint initiative of library organizations in US, Canada, Europe, and CORE. Uh, and then we also have uh, a working group on uh, long tail of research data, because that's something uh, new and interesting that is coming up to our libraries. But I'm here to talk about a uh, report on sustainable practices for populating repositories. And um, uh, this report uh, describes a number of successful profiles. And um, it talks about incentives, how you can promote uh, more content in repositories through advocacy and metrics, as well as through adoption of policies and mandates uh, Stephen was talking about earlier today. Uh, then integration is another area it addresses uh, because we want to make sure that open access repositories are linked to research information systems and research biographies. And then mediation is how we can use mediated approaches to increase content in repositories. So it basically describes eight profiles, uh, advocacy, institutional mandates, metrics, recruitment and deposit services, research biographies, institutional profiles, publisher agreements, and direct deposit. And um, advocacy, of course, because researchers and research administrators uh, need to know exact benefits from repositories. They, they wouldn't be involved just because they believe in the idea that open access or repository is good. And they also need to feel that repository is their own. It's not a library program, it's, it's their program. And um, uh, in order to have large advocacy initiatives, there is International Open Access Week celebrating every year in uh, October, and many Polish uh, institutions are really involved. Uh, then uh, there is an interesting approach in Japan, 
because we, we are an international organization, so we have members in Japan, and they call it Hita Hita, which is a Japanese word for slow and gentle approach. So, uh, so they, they really keep talking about open access to researchers really every day, and they, they can see some small changes with, which gradually accumulates and grow into something bigger. Uh, students are also very important stakeholders, and what we found uh, out working with students that uh, with them we can really make a lot of changes, and we were very fortunate to work uh, with uh, our Polish partners uh, on a small project, uh, how students can be open access advocates, so probably you, you know this person. And I also like uh, this Polish portal uh, on uh, opening science. I think that's, that's also a good example of uh, advocacy initiatives that could be done uh, uh, by students. Um, so it's really important to have champions to work with, either right? so senior academics, research managers, uh, active students. Uh, second approach, institutional mandates. So you've already seen this slide today. Uh, number of mandates are growing, but not so fast as we'd like to. And I really like example of the University of Liège that Stephen mentioned earlier today. And uh, I like those quotes from the rector, Bernard Rentier, who said uh, the reason why he was interested in introducing an open access mandate, because uh, he really wanted to know what university produces. Because if you don't know, it's like a factory that doesn't know what it produces, which is really ridiculous. But if you think about that, uh, I, I bet not every university knows what it produces. Then why do you need a mandate? Because uh, empty repository is useful, partially filled repository is partially useful, and only with mandate you can, you can really have a full repository. Uh, it's also important that Bernard Rentier doesn't impose. Uh, he, he just tells researchers that only publications which are available in, his, uh, in, in their repository, Orbi, will be considered for evaluation. So if you, if you didn't make sure that your publication is there, then it looks like your publication won't be counted. And uh, that repository is not actually just a place where you can access publications, uh, but it's uh, a personal workspace where you can have statistics, you can have widgets to generate your publication pages, so it's really much more than just a place where you store your publications. Then metrics is another example, and our Chinese colleagues uh, in Chinese Academy of Sciences, they have a very powerful repo national repository grid, and they supply, supply lots of usage metrics uh, on institutional level, on national institutional, and also on individual level. Uh, monthly download statistics, something really small you can easily generate, uh, also seem to be useful. And uh, uh, when you have your publications in repository, uh, it really helps you to have much richer data for quality and impact assessment of your work. Alt metrics uh, hasn't been mentioned too much yet today. I think it's worth mentioning. It's alternative metrics uh, that uh, doesn't only look at number of journal impact factors and number of citations, but also at conversations which are going on around this paper on Twitter, social networks, uh, uh, so a lot richer usage metrics are important. Uh, of course, ideally, we would like every researcher to self-archive publications, but uh, unfortunately, in reality, that's not the case. Uh, so if we really want to have a populated repository, we need to have some kind of assisted deposition. And uh, this could be either done together with departmental uh, uh, administrative staff uh, or uh, some libraries just use publishers alerts and when they see that a new publication of a faculty member has been published, they just email this person saying congratulations with your publication, by the way, would you like to make a copy of this article available in our repository and if you do, we can do this for you. So that really works well. Uh, then uh, cross-departmental collaborations uh, could be set up. 
And some universities like Harvard, for example, they even employed some students who helped to populate repository with metadata. Uh, researcher biographies is another incentive you can use to encourage researchers to deposit. And uh, in, in the Netherlands, NARCIS is a national portal. Uh, we can only have uh, access to publications, but also you can uh, see researchers' biographies linked to publications. Uh, integrating with research information systems, uh, crisis. I don't know whether many people in Poland use those current research information systems. If you do, it's really good when you link that to repository. That was the case of St. Andrews University that really helped to populate it. And also, if you use this space, uh, there is a plugin available uh, that you can use to link between three systems and this space repositories. Finally, publishers' agreements. Uh, uh, that's something that is done on the national level, uh, I know, in Poland, uh, and also Germany is another example where open access clauses are part of commercial licenses negotiated uh, uh, by science organizations. And there's also a similar approach uh, in Sweden, in Finland, and that's what the World Bank does as well. And then finally, direct depositing. Uh, for example, uh, Biomed Central uh, has a uh, very good automated article deposit. Uh, so if you, are, if you are a member of, if your institution is a main member of Biomed Central, uh, all articles published by your institutional members will be automatically deposited in your institutional repository. In my slides, there will be some references. Report is, of course, uh, openly available. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention.